Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Lou Perosi. Um, ele elements of three-dimensional design and how it relates to color. So normally when we're thinking about color, we're always thinking about painting, right? Rarely do we think about it and how it may relate to a three-dimensional object, you know, some form that sort of um, exists like a chair or a uh, vase or a piece of sculpture, but actually color plays a really big part in three-dimensional design as well. So the first thing we want to do is just have a little conversation about what color is. Um, so I've got a little bit of lengthy stuff here. I'll just go ahead and read it a little bit for you, and then we'll kind of get into it. Color is the aspect of things that is caused by differing qualities of light um, being reflected or emanated by them. To see color, you have to have light. When light shines on an object, some col colors bounce off the object and others are absorbed by it, okay? The definition of color is a component of light which is separated when it is reflected off an object. For an example of color is the blue in a rainbow, okay? And we'll get into this a little bit more further here in a second. And color is an element consisting of hues of which there are three properties, hue, chroma, or intensity, and value. Um, color is present when light strikes an object and it is reflected back onto the eyes um, and a reaction to the hue arising in that optic nerve, okay? So what does all that mean? Um, we like to think that things that uh, objects and surfaces have color, but they don't, okay? So let's say that, let's repeat that again. We like to think that objects and surfaces have color, but they don't. So what? So things don't have color? Uh, not really. Um, despite the impression that objects are, are certain colors, colors exist not on the surface we see, but in our brains. Okay, and we're going to get in that in a second. Colors exist as invisible energy waves in white light. We pick up these waves of electromagnetic radiation when they are either reflected or reflected uh, when passed through a prism light is broken down or refracted into the rainbow of a, of a visual spectrum. Okay, so light goes in, okay, goes through a spectrum and then comes out in different colors. And we can take a look at that and think about all those colors of a rainbow. So again, that may be hard to really think that objects actually don't have colors, but our, our eyes and our retinas and the back of our um, skulls uh, sort of is able to do that. So uh, reflection occurs when light strikes an opaque surface. Waves of certain lengths are absorbed, others are reflected. When these reflected waves are conveyed to rods and cones in the retina of our eyes, the sensation is transmitted as a particular color. So we want to think about, so how do we see color? Color is a way that we describe an object based on the way it reflects or emanates light. Um, your eyes can see different colors because a part of your eyes called the retina is sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Light, okay? So you see how it sort of goes in, comes out. Again, it's not exactly on the surface of the object. Um, yeah, okay? So what does all that mean? Is this a science class? Is it, do we need to know all this? No, but I think it's it's good to have that as a little bit of a backstory for us to talk about color. So again, this is an art class, not a biology class. So let's get into a, some ways that we might want to use it. Um, so how, as artists, especially as three-dimensional artists, okay, sculptors, we want to may even want to think of ourselves. Um, let's think about how we can use color. So the first way that we can really begin to talk about color is natural color. What does that mean? Well, it's working with the natural color or characteristics of a particular material. Um, you know, crafts people may polish or wax or sand or carve a material, but they leave the material mostly in its natural state. So if we're taking a look at this woman over here, she's 
we, you know, she's beginning to weave this basket with this natural material, right? This kind of fiber, um, straw-like material, and she's making it into a basket. Uh, these are all examples of wood. The artist has really put his artistic style on it, but again, just using the natural surface. So if we take a look at this, we've got some non-representational pieces. You can begin to see how the wood is put together and it's, it's all different colors, right? We have these openings. The artist is really taking that material as it is and creating something out of this. If we take a look at this piece in the middle, which is representational right it's a figurative thing really the natural wood isn't that really a cool piece i really love that piece a lot um it's done by christopher davis white and again just using the natural material a lot of times we can look on to the piece on the right we've got this sort of high relief um you know, we're just simply carving away the natural material. And so that's how you can see it as wood, again, using that, getting that natural color. Now, it not all, uh, um, a lot of times artists will use um, other materials, not just wood or fiber, but let's take a look at these. Here we see this piece over here to our left. We're letting that natural weathered steel get rusted. We're using its natural color, right? Uh, Tutankhamun, which is primarily made up of gold, we're just letting that gold just do its thing, right? Isn't that just absolutely beautiful? We've got other things going on there, but again, a lot of natural materials in there. Uh, we are using some gemstones and other things in there, but again, real natural materials. Um, pretty much unchecked by itself. If we look at the piece on the right, we'll notice that that's uh, brass and you know it's slightly oxidized and so we get this really interesting color. But again, look at how different these colors are depending on the metal. Uh, stone, we can say the same thing. Um, if we look here, here's basalt. Um, we've got that natural material right there, right? And you got this beautiful um, stylized head um, and if we look at the piece in the middle, uh, the Petra, uh, Michelangelo's, I got an opportunity to see this piece. It's incredible to think that uh, he carved this out of marble um, and just every detail. But again, we're actually looking at a stone. And if we look over here at the Mayan uh, civilization, we're unclear of who the artist is, but look at how we're using the jade as an artist to create this really beautiful um, face, right? This, again, stylized face, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And that's how we can use stone. Uh, we can even use ceramics. We could show a lot of different examples. We've shown you the terracotta soldiers, right? And, you know, they're letting that natural terracotta clay uh, be exposed there. We're going to talk about that in a, in a little bit when we talk about applied color. Uh, but as for the clay itself, that's what these colors are. If we're going to take a look at Richard Notkin's piece, he's using a type of clay that's called Yixing clay. It's a really beautiful clay. Um, I've had a, I had an opportunity to go to Yixing myself and see these uh, traditionally made in China. Um, the clay is actually a dark brown. It comes in a variety of different browns. Browns actually, you can find them in yellow and purple and green. It's, it's really pretty neat. But again, just that natural color from that uh, clay allows you to get that interesting surface. And then Rudy Staffel's work, uh, he works with what we call translucent porcelain, uh, just the raw clay by itself, uh, no glaze surface on there, um, just working with that natural color. And if we look, we can see how different that is as well, okay? Um, and then we can just kind of talk miscellaneously, okay, D using different things. So if we look at this head on the left, that's actually made of ivory. Uh, nobody should be working with ivory right now. Um, I think it's illegal in the world, um, hopefully all over, because obviously you have to get it from elephants and rhinos, and we don't want to do that right now, right? Uh, but it's a beautiful piece uh, that was created, good carvings, but again, using that natural ivory. Uh, and then here we can take a look at this mosque. Uh, it's just made of, of mud and, and, and wood. And it's just, I mean, as you can see, it's, it's really large. 
and uh, has a really beautiful surface. And we can even take it one step further and look at this piece on the right. And we're using just grass, okay? Or really a living material. Uh, interesting material to choose. So again, you can look out in your world. There's a lot of different natural materials that you as an artist can use. So let's talk about applied color. So what exactly does that mean? Color added to a material, concealing or changing its original color. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat that again. Applied color, color added to a material, material concealing or changing its original color. Uh, remember those terracotta soldiers I said I was going to get right back to? Let's take a look at that. Originally, they were actually painted. Um, and over time, the paints just either went away, um, you know, because that was 1215 BC. So, you know, over 2,200 uh, years ago. So this is what they would have looked like. But we, but that's where we're using applied, uh, applied color. Here's where we're using just sort of the natural color of the clay. And believe it or not, if you ever go to Europe or mostly all over the world, if mainly the Greek and Roman statues were actually painted. So we don't see them in their, their, their natural state. They were intended as the artists a long time ago. We usually will see them in these stages. But it's nice to think about them if they had this really beautiful, bold colors like we're seeing on these other figures. Um, it definitely gives it a different sensibility, doesn't it? Um, where we get these little pops of color. I mean, look at the drapery there compared to that. Um, Really interesting, really interesting. So think about that the next time you're taking a look at Greek and Roman statues. Um, little shameless promotion of my stuff, but again, I'm applying a surface to the top layer of my clay. If we look over here, I'm actually creating uh, a glaze that's sort of blue or aqua, I like to think about it, uh, on the surface. Here is also another glaze surface. This is a wheel thrown teapot. Um, I'm applying that surface. I'm changing, I'm covering up that actual clay color. If you were to take a look at that, this is actually sort of a brownish color. This is a white color. Again, it's porcelain. It's a porcelain clay, so um, it's very white in nature. And the same over here, um, that piece on the right. Again, just a slight change in color there. But again, I'm covering up that original ceramic or clay surface, okay? Uh, ceramics and clay, they're sort of two different things. Clay is unfired clay. Ceramics is when it's been fired up and it's chemically changed and it actually hardens. Uh, painted wood, this is another real good example of that, okay? So take a look at this. Think about that impression that the artist is trying to get out of this, really adding that color as that le extra level of excitement. If we look at the piece in the middle, um, again, um, envision that just being without the paint. With the paint, it's really beautiful, isn't it? Uh, this sort of totem pole, um, that the vibrant colors really brings this particular piece to life. And if we take a look at this piece, again, these are really some interesting uh, painted colors. I guess the whole thing is wood, uh, quite impressive. Um, painted metal, I like to say it um, in some ways, because when we think about metal, we can take a look at uh, Paul Bradley's piece. And so we've got some red, some blue, We can take a look at the Jeff Koons piece, and it's mere polished stainless steel with transparent color coating. Okay, so again, all three of these artists, including John Chamberlain, we've got these painted surfaces for metal, very different from the Tutankhamen I showed you earlier, and that brass uh, head. Um, just showing it as different media. I forget what these are made out of. I want to say paper mache, but I could be completely uh, wrong about that. Red Grooms did some really interesting pieces. He's worth looking up. Um, this is, I think, it's, it's a bus. It's like an inflatable bus. People come on and come off. It's a participatory sculpture. Um, just really a lot of fun. Uh, a little narrative about, uh, I think, New York City. If we take a look at these pieces on the right, I'm not sure what this these are made out of. Um, but again, we see a good use of color on the surface. 
So one of the things we want to talk about or the next area is psychological effects of color. We not, may not normally think about those in those terms, but really by using certain colors, we can achieve certain goals. Colors can have some attachment to it. So what does that mean? Artists can use colors to create a feeling uh, in the viewer, a feeling or a mood really in the viewer. The way we feel about color is rooted in many different ways, okay? It can be inherent within us. Um, how we experience the world, what our culture is telling us about color, and our feelings about color can change over time. So some of the ways people felt about colors in the 1920s is very different than we feel about them now. When I'm saying inherent in us, um, I'm referring to, you know, as we explore our own world, um, how we might think about green. Green is on leaves on a tree, um, the, the blue of water, the brown of wood. They, they bring us all different types of feelings, right? And then our culture can tell us. Uh, certain colors mean different things in different cultures. So, you know, we just have to be aware of all of those things because even if we think we may be achieving a certain thing, um, we, we have to be conscious of all of those things, right? So let's think about color in a couple of different ways. We can think about colors as referring to them as warm and cool colors. And we're gonna kind of start off that way. So when we think of warm colors, so we'll take a look at the things on the left, um, we wanna think about the sun. Uh, so red, orange, and yellow. Uh, uh, I should say that, um, I don't know why I put cool colors recede in space. Warm colors actually come to the forefront of your vision, okay? So they pop out at you. And if we look at cool colors, so cool colors we think of um, so, sort of water or grass, they sort of recede in space, they kind of fall back, okay? So if you have uh, red on top of blue, that little red spot is actually gonna pop out. Um, and that, that blue will sort of recede a little bit. So again, sort of uh, blue, green, and violet. And here's a good chart for you to take a look at if we're thinking about warm and cool. All these guys are sort of in that category. We talked about those just a second ago. And then these guys, violet, we, you know, it's a good word for sort of purple color, right? Violet's really the official term, but for most folks, that's what that color uh, stands for. And you can kind of see that nice color wheel of how things are broken broken apart, okay? Um, so what are we thinking about warm colors? Colors that remind you of lava, fire, and the sun. Examples of warm color are red, violet, red, red, orange, orange, yellow, yellow, orange, and so on and so forth. Warm colors take up half of the color wheel, which I showed you. Um, cool colors remind us of ice, water, soil, and snow. Examples of cool color are blue, blue, green, green, violet, uh, blue, violet, and so on, okay? Now, something we might not be thinking about is actually how branding uses colors. You know, we aren't even conscious of it for the most time, but let's take a look at this. When we think about colors, we start to break up. Now, there's something that certain colors represent. So if we take a look at excitement and boldness, which is red, Coca-Cola, right? Um, Target, okay? Uh, Heinz, all right? Those are all sort of that. And if we think of trust, we usually will think of blue. Um, we think of Oreos or Facebook, which I'm not sure about right now. Maybe that's not a great... Um, Example, but AT and T, uh, AT and T is uh, you know we want to think about it as trusted, okay? And so this is always a kind of a fun thing to just take a look at. So if we start to break down colors, um, you know we can think about it of a couple of different ways. But red is like excitement, love, right? Strength, energy, passion. Blue is trust, competitiveness, loyalty, intellect, and so on and so forth, okay? You could take a look at this in the attached PowerPoint and really get a sense for how sometimes colors are played out. Um, I really like this one a lot. Again, these don't always cover everything, but we can start to break down. So if we take a look at black, sophisticated, power, mystery, 
uh, formality, evil and death. Um, if we look at yellow, joy, cheerfulness, friendliness, intellect, energy, warmth, caution, and cowardice. So let's kind of break this down. I always like to think about Star Wars, okay? It's kind of a popular thing. If you haven't seen Star Wars, you've probably been living in a box. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was a great movie that, that was in the mid-70s all the way up till today. I think Disney bought them out. I'm not an expert at this. But let's just take a look at a couple of the characters. The first character is Darth Vader, right? Their premier bad guy, if you've, if you've seen it. Um, so let's take a look. I just showed you that last box. How many of those things do, are we able to check off? Power, for sure. He's a very powerful character if you've watched it. Uh, mystery, mystery, he's a very mysterious figure, right? Kind of scary. Um, he's got his head covered up. Um, evil, yeah, definitely, right? And death. I mean, think about even his first name, Darth. It's pretty close to death. Um, and, you know, if you've watched the show, he's not particularly nice. I think he's brought a lot of uh, death, right? And if we look at the color red, we can also notice some things. <clears throat> Maybe not romance or style, <clears throat> but certainly danger, right? Certainly danger and urgency. This guy showed up in a room. You are, there is going to be a certain sense of urgency that's going to go with this character, okay? This three-dimensional person. And if we take a look at the good guy, uh, Luke Skywalker, who's in white, what do we thought? He's a lot of hope. Okay, I think even the title of the first thing was what? Something with hope? I, I forget exactly. Uh, purity, right? Cleanness, and, uh, not, maybe not so much, but certainly goodness. Um, you know, he's, he's part of the light, um, hope. Okay, purity. And then look, notice the blue lightsaber. Do you think that's by coincidence? Um, stability, confident, confidence, uh, integrity. Okay, so these things do not happen by chance. Okay, if next time you watch your favorite show, sort of to match up some of those terms, and I think you're going to actually find that they correlate pretty well to stuff. Uh, I love Whole Foods, um, and so when I think about Whole Foods, think about that chart I showed you again. Um, think about what green is, life, okay? Uh, when we think of Whole Foods, we think about how plants may grow, they're alive, there's that growth. We think about the environment, right? A lot of their products are like uh, organic, and uh, they're good for the environment, right? Uh, freshness. It all goes with that. Again, not by coincidence, and maybe even relaxation a little bit. You know, you go to Whole Foods, I think they've even got a whole aisle of relaxation products. They've got, you know, potions and all sorts of stuff over there. So it, it is worth checking out. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my work as well. Artists use color to create a mood or a feeling in the viewer. Um, I'm making the viewer unconsciously in this work, uh, unconsciously think about water and waves, peace, tra tranquility, and calmness, okay? When I wanted to make this particular body of work, I called it the Aqua Series. I wanted it to remind people of water. And so if you're going to make something that reminds you of water, you're going to use, uh, you know, sort of that turquoise color or a blue and then I put waves in the work to just give that little reflection of water. I wanted my work to have a sense of calmness, tranquility, and peacefulness. Okay, Again, not by coincidence that I chose these particular colors as an artist. And you can too. So when you begin to make your pieces, start to think about those ways that we think about color. And if I'm going to use green, the same deal. Again, this is some of my pieces. I'm making the viewer unconsciously think about vegetation, forests, leaves, okay, growth and stuff. By having this dark green, that's what I want you to think about. Now, what's interesting about this work is that's going to be what people are going to be thinking about unconsciously. But if it's a certain time of year, like I say, Christmas, I usually like to have these darker green pieces with pieces that are red. And then unconsciously, people are thinking about Christmas. 
but I'll usually will sell these more in the summertime. Um, Tony Tassett, uh, artwork. I mean, he just played into the whole theme of color in terms of mood, right? So if we look at the top, it's smiling, positive connotations, optimism, confidence, self-esteem, friendliness, um, orange, comfort, warmth, lewd, plainness, right? Pretty good smile. Uh, danger, defiance, aggression. Yeah, it's kind of in between, right? And then here, negative. So when we think about colors, they don't always think they have positive and negative connotations. These are little images that I pulled up from that um, one thing that I sent you earlier. Uh, so take a good look at those. I mean, we could really get that. You can really play with that. Again, negative connotations. We got the wah, 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 sad face, right? Suppression, introverse, and moodiness. And you don't want to be this guy, right? He's sadness, cold, and depressed. And this gives, this is, I believe this is the artist, gives you some indication as to how tall this is. But again, he even called it mood sculpture, tying in color. I thought that was really interesting. Um, he, I have a friend who works at his studio, Matt Federico. This artist actually is Chicago-based, or he has a lot of stuff done in Chicago. Uh, worth looking up. Um, does some really neat things. Uh, look at this, huh? Have you ever got a chance of this? Uh, artists use color to create a mood or feeling. What? How does that make you feel, that giant rubber ducky? Look at the size of that. Um, it probably brings you joyful, cheerfulness, friendliness, right? Energy, a little bit of warmth, okay? I wouldn't say caution and cowardice. That's certainly not it. But again, those are those negative connotations that we may have for yellow. Um, artists use, again, uh, to create a, a mood or feeling. So while we looked at the Darth Vader, more of those negative connotations of red with that lightsaber. Here we're going to see a little different. We've got the word content of love, but again, we've got passion here, right? Romance, excitement. Um, those are all words that sort of define this particular piece. All right. Now we're going to kind of kind of switch gears a little bit. Talk about uh, color the way almost 2D artists or painters may want it. Just to reiterate some of these things, um, color comes from light, which we talked about earlier. Light contains all colors. When the light ray hits an object, our eyes respond to light. It bounces back. And then we see color. A um, couple things we might want to think about. Hue refers to the color name. Okay, so that's, that's kind of important. The term is used to point out the differences between you know, blue, green, red, or yellow. Uh, now, when we think about color, we can start to break it down. When we look at color, uh, some seem to be brighter or purer than others, such as qualities to refer to as colors intensity, okay, or quality of brightness and purity. So when we think about intensity, look at the differences of blue, right? Here's bright, intense blue. Then we got low intensity of blue, right? Um, we're sort of adding, I think, white to this to sort of get that intensity down of that blue color. Um, we also want to think about value uh, when we're talking about color. When describing a hue, the term value refers to the, the, the hue's lightness or darkness. Value changes are often obtained by adding black or white to a particular hue. Adding black creates a shade. Adding white creates a tint. So if we take a look at this, we're going to add black. Look at how we make that blue more like a darker blue, right? And when we add white, it becomes almost a very light blue, right? But again, we think about value adding black and white. So value the lightness of darkness in a work even when color is absent. Black and white images are great examples of things with value. Um, we can see a landscape, we can see a portrait simply by looking at black and white, right? And then all those shades in between or all those values in between. So we take a look at this. Value is lightness and darkness of a color. We've got the light here going to the darkness. And again, if we use all of these values, we can really create 
Again, we can see a portrait, we can see a landscape by adding all these things. Now, when we start to think about value, um, we can think about it as, again, three-dimensional artists or sculptures. This is Beth Kavanagh's work. These are ceramics. I love it, okay? Great sense of low intensity of color, right? Low intensity. Um, we've softened everything, okay? We've, we've added a lot of white to it, um, to our natural colors. It's not super bright. Um, I once went to a workshop where she says, I, she uses, um, what's her name? Martha Stewart paints, uh, cause you know, they're warm and soothing to people. And then she just adds, you know, either black or white into it, kind of slightly changes the color, I believe, but, uh, does some really interesting sculptures, right? And these are huge too. These, by the way, are almost life size. I once seen a deer, two headed deer that was like the size of two deers on a wall. So hue, again, is the name of the color, so red. So let's take a look at the intensity, the purity, and strength of a color. Look at how intense that is. And look as we start to work down, we get this value, the lightness and darkness of a color. Okay, again, we're adding black, we're adding white, we're going through the value. Um, here's a good use of intensity, right? So even though we just showed you Beth Kavanagh stitch, where, uh, or Beth Kavanagh, I should say. I apologize for that. Um, uh, if we look at this, this is kind of like a high intensity. Ron Nagel, he's based out of uh, uh, San Francisco. Look at the intensity of that color. Isn't that intense? Look at the intensity of that. Now, this one's interesting, right? Because we have low intensity um, juxtaposition with this high intensity piece. And so that really makes this sort of, having a low intensity piece here really gets this back area to pop, right? Um, here's another way you can think about color. I'm not going to go through this. You can take a look at this in the PowerPoint. Some of this we colored, but you know, we could talk a little bit secondary colors, primary colors, definitely take a look at it in the PowerPoint. But again, we can use a lot of different colors um, to benefit our artwork, which we've sort of shown, right? Um, and just to kind of finish this up, I want to show you a fun little thing. I just had to throw this in there. Uh, take a look at this dark gray. Uh, these We've got two blocks, right? We've got a dark gray, and then we've got sort of a white color. Just put your finger in the middle of uh, this white and black area. Tell me what you see. Put it right there. Just cover it up, and then take a look at it. And what do you notice? Both of those grays, even though the top one seems darker than the uh, bottom one, they're exactly the same, right? Um, just a fun little thing. But anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation on color and how it relates to three-dimensional objects. Again, we as artists have a lot of different elements of uh, design at our disposal. We want to use them all, right? So we can use color, we can use space, we can use time. We can use uh, line um, and form and so on and so forth. So again, my name's Lou Perosi. Uh, thanks again for watching and we'll be talking to you real soon. Thanks.